And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you for the saints. Thank you for your word. We pray that the time would be used profitably. We pray that we would increase in understanding, that we would be established, and that we would be equipped to do the work of the ministry that you would have us to do. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. So Greg demonstrated pretty clearly yesterday that Daniel speaks of 70 weeks, and he, he also demonstrated that the 70th week is the last of those weeks. It lasts seven years. Now, as, as we begin this study, there's something that occurred to me that I just want to share with you. If you think about the chart, for example, and for, let's just think for a minute about Noah. So Noah is on the far left of the chart, just barely in. <coughs> from, from creation to Noah is approximately 1,650 years. So if you think of the chart as a whole, it's roughly 7,000 years, but it's, but it's obviously not to scale. And I'm not criticizing, but just making an observation, right? So in other words, thinking of the chart, you go from Adam to Noah, and that's like, I don't know, one-twelfth of the chart or something, but it's 1,600 years. It's, it's nearly a fourth of the entire time. Why do I mention that? Well, as you think about the 70th week, think about it a little bit in relation to that time in the scriptures between creation and Noah. In other words, there's 1,600 years there, but is there a lot of the Bible devoted to that 1,600 years? There's really not very much, right? You, you have part of, a small part of Genesis, you have a little bit in Job, but you don't have a whole lot. Contrast that with the 70th week. How long does the 70th week last? Not a trick question, seven years, right? But how much of the Bible is devoted to the 70th week? Well, parts of Daniel, a lot of Revelation, there's some other verses on there, Matthew 24, Mark, I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch devoted to it. My, my point is, as we think about the topic of the 70th week, there's a lot that Scripture has to say about it. What I would like to do to try to uh, approach this topic is to look at Matthew 24. So look at Matthew 24, and <clears throat> we'll spend a lot of time in Matthew 24 going through it verse by verse, and just trying to see what it tells us about the 70th week. So we'll start in verse 3, Matthew 24, verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Verse 3 is the disciples asking that question, and most of the rest of the chapter is the Lord answering it. So he's going to answer those specific questions. When shall these things be? It's talking about the, the end of the world, if you will. And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So Matthew 24 is one of the most helpful single chapters in understanding the 70th week. Verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a few moments, but just notice that one of the issues with the 70th week is deception. Verse 5, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now notice what verse 5 says. It says, Many shall come in my name. We know that during the 70th week, there is, of course, the beast, the man of sin. And he's going to go into the temple and show himself that he is God. He's obviously a false Christ because there's a man there claiming himself to be God. But what verse 5 says is it says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. I believe that what happens shortly before the second coming, and of course the 70th week is shortly before the second coming, is there are numerous false Christs just as there were before the first coming. So look with me at Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verse 34. Now one of the things you know from, from your prior Bible study is that 
Satan is a counterfeiter. What he does is he very frequently emulates things that God the Father is doing. This is simply another example of that. Acts chapter 5, verse 34. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space, and said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days, so this happened beforehand, rose up Thudius, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about four hundred, joined themselves, who was slain, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing, and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. So those two gentlemen there aren't mentioned a lot in the scriptures, but let's understand what we can learn from that. Satan knew the approximate time when the Lord Jesus Christ would arrive in the flesh. Because he understood the Old Testament prophecies. And, and we won't take the time to prove this. How did the wise men know to show up at the Lord's birth? Well, th they understood from the scriptures, right? That they understood the, the approximate timing. Even if men don't understand what the scriptures say, Satan knows exactly what they say. The very first thing he does in Genesis 3 is, Yea, hath God said. He wasn't asking because he didn't know. He was asking because he did know, and he was going to corrupt it. You follow me? So, Satan knows the approximate timing of the first coming, so what does he do? He has false Christ that show up in advance to lead people astray. Now, that accomplishes two things. Number one, it leads people astray. Number two, when the true Christ shows up, what do people think? We've seen this before. These people come every so often, they're frauds. A, a, a similar example of what's going on today, it does not help the cause of truth that people keep predicting the rapture is next Thursday. Right? Because they predict it, you know, they predicted in 1988, it doesn't happen. They predicted in 2000, it doesn't happen. They predicted, if I recall correctly, September 2015. When that didn't happen, they said, oh, it's actually October. That didn't happen. And so what happens if you're a covenant theologian? Well, the covenant theologians are absolutely wrong on the scriptures. But errant dispensationalists that keep saying the rapture is this date cause mockery of the truth. And so the covenant theologians can say, look, th these dispensationalists, they're obviously wrong because they keep pointing out dates and it keeps not happening. You follow me? Well, I think something similar happens with the false Christ, right? Satan has false Christ that show up before the first coming. And what Matthew 24, verse 5 tells you, he has false Christs that appear before the second coming. Obviously the most notable one being the beast himself. My point being, and let's go back to Matthew 24, my point just being this. What Satan does, Satan has a keen understanding of the actual events of Scripture and their timing, and he designs his deceptions and his frauds to leverage that to make those deceptions as effective as possible. Matthew 24, verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. On verse 6, I'll just make the point that it's warning about wars and also rumors of wars. One of the things that happens, and this is just human nature, is that people get too caught up in rumors. They get too caught up in sort of the scuttlebutt of the day. That perhaps is heightened during the internet age, right? Where what happens is people live on Facebook, and I, I, you already know this, is everything on the internet true? No, it's not true. And what happens is, is it moves faster, 
right? It moves faster than things did before that. So be wary of rumors. Verse 6 says, the end is not yet. We're going to talk about that more in just a minute. I think Matthew 24 gives you a very specific definition of what the end is, and I'll show you that. Matthew 24, verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. Here's one of the things that happens. So it talks, it warns there of famines, and pestilence, and earthquakes in diverse places. And then verse 8 says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Now here's what typically happens in, in, in most common interpretations of the scriptures. People look at events that are occurring, current events, things they read in the newspaper, famines, pestilences, earthquakes. Can you point to those things happening right now? You can, right? There are earthquakes that happen, there's famines, there's pestilences, there's all of those things. And verse 8 says that that is the beginning of sorrow. So what people do is they see those things, they say, well, here's where we are in Matthew 24. But just think about this with me for a moment. There is no Old Testament prophecy that is being fulfilled during the dispensation of grace. And, and the reason you know that is in Acts chapter 2, when Peter stands up, and he says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he immediately talks about the last days. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the coming of the great notable day of the Lord. In Acts 2, Peter by the Holy Ghost is saying the 70th week is around the corner. So what Greg demonstrated yesterday about the 69th week, after the 69th week, the Messiah is cut off. Well, when the Messiah is cut off at the cross, under the Old Testament program, what should you expect to happen next? The 70th week, right? The 69th week concluded because the Messiah was cut off. We expect the 70th week to be next. In Acts 2, he stands up, and, and by the power of the Holy Ghost, he says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So anyone with a brain that's listening to him says, I know what's next, the prophet Joel. What Joel talks about is he talks about the coming of the day of the Lord. The sun shall be darkness, the moon to blood. So that's what should have happened, but of course we all know what did happen. God the Father decided to interrupt the dispensation of grace, right? Wow, that was a mistake, but I guess it tells whether or not you're listening. <laughs> what did God interrupt? He interrupted the prophetic program with the dispensation of grace, right? He took the prophetic program and, and put it on hold. He gave it a time out. What people do all the time is they look at 1948. Well, Israel's back in the land. That must be the fulfillment of Ezekiel. Or they look at something else that they read in the newspaper and they say, this is the fulfillment of, of Old Testament prophecy. It cannot be. If Old Testament prophecy was still being fulfilled, then what would have happened is Joel 2 would have occurred during the first century, because that's what Peter specifically said. But the fact that didn't occur tells you that the dispensational mid position is correct. That what happened is the prophetic calendar was put on hold. So when you read things in Matthew 24, verses 7 and 8, when you read other things like that in the Gospels, it, those things cannot be fulfilled today because the dispensation of grace is an interruption of the prophetic program. Matthew 24, verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. When it says they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, that is a reference to the persecution of the believing remnant in Israel. It is not the persecution of all of Israel. So one of the things that's critical as you're thinking about the 70th week is you have to keep in your mind the distinction between the apostate nation and the believing nation. So look with me at Matthew 21, verse 23. Matthew 21, verse 23. And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching, 
and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? Now we're going to skip down to verse 43, but what I want you to notice from verse 23 is the Lord is, is dealing with the chief priests and the elders. That's who is raising the question. Look at verse 43. Therefore I say unto you, and the you is the chief priests and elders. It's those that raise the question with him. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, that's the chief priests and elders, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. So what the Lord is saying to the leaders of Israel is, the kingdom is not yours. It's going to be taken from you. Now they think, don't they, don't they at various times in the gospel say, we're Abraham's descendants. We're the chosen people. And what the Lord specifically says to them is, you're not going to get the kingdom. It's being taken from you, and it's going to be given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Now, we know from Luke 12, 32, who that is. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I'll give you an example, a, a real-life example. And I, and I once um, I, I saw a document like this. During the 1970s, when there was ex extreme interest in the rapture, what people would sometimes do is they would create clauses in their estate planning documents. So typically what happens when you have a will is if I die, leave so and su such and such to my spouse. If my spouse is not here, leave it to my children. If my children aren't here, leave it to my brother, my cousin, whatever, right? You typically have a series of, of essentially contingencies. What people would do at that time because there was a lot of interest in the rapture, is they would essentially say, some would, if there's a rapture, then leave all of my property to the state of Israel. And the reason why they were doing that is, here's essentially their thought process. Well, if the rapture happens, then hopefully I'm gone, <laughs> my wife's gone, and my descendants are gone, right? If Hopefully that's the case. So what do I want to do with it? Well, their thought process was, at the end of the dispensation of grace, the body of Christ is all gone. So who becomes God's people at that point? Well, look at the chart. So you can see, you can see during the dispensation of grace that Jew and Gentile are on equal footing, and it's not good, because they've been concluded all in unbelief. After the rapture, what happens? Well, the middle wall of partition is, is, is reinstituted, and Israel again becomes God's people. So they thought they're doing something productive by leaving their assets to Israel. But think through that with me for a moment. If that's what you do, who's going to get it? Well, what's going to happen is no doubt the and I, you know this is no doubt the lawyers administering that are going to send it to the political state of Israel the one that's recognized as a legal body. And who's it going to go to? It's going to go to the apostate nation. And where is the little flock, go, the believing nation, where are they going to be? Especially during the latter half of the week. Well, they're going to be out in the, out in the wilderness. They're not going to have a mailing address. Right? You're not going to be able to send a check to them. Now, the, the point, my point just telling you all that is you have to think about these things precisely. That there is fundamentally a difference during that time between the Israel that the world will recognize, the nation, the body politic, the, the, the much bigger group, and the, how, what kind of flock is it? It's the little flock. They're small. They will be viewed as insignificant. And so there's a big difference there. Matthew 24, verse 10. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. The way that offended is used in the, in the scriptures, my understanding, is it's believers falling away from the truth. When it talks about people being offended. Look with me at Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6 verse 4. 
Hebrews 6, chapter 4, and this is going to tell us something of, of how salvation works during uh, the 70th week. Hebrews 6, 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and, of the, and the powers of the world to come. So these folks are described as enlightened. They've tasted of the heavenly gift. They're partakers of the Holy Ghost. They tasted the good world of God. Then notice what verse 6 says. If they shall fall away. So are there people during the 70th week that taste of the heavenly gift and the Holy Ghost and so on, and then they fall away? That's what the verse is saying. Then notice what happens. If they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. When Matthew 24, 10 says, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another, there are people that fall away from the truth during that time. Get with me 1 John 2, verse 19. 1 John 2, verse 19. First John chapter 2, verse 19. This is a fascinating verse. They went out from us, but they were not of us. So in other words, were they ever really part of the believing remnant? They weren't. They were not of us. For if they had been of us, if they'd been real, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that, that, that they might be manifest that they were not all of us. I'm going to suggest to you that here's what happens. The tribulation that occurs during the 70th week is designed to separate the wheat from the tares. There are going to be people that are part of the little flock in the sense that they're visibly part of the little flock. But what's going to happen to some of them? They're going to fall away. And they're going to go out from us. They're going to leave. Why? Because they're not of us. And that's what's going to happen during the, the 70th week. It's obviously a time of testing. Go back to Matthew 24, verse 11. Now, by the way, I'll just say this before I go on. Are you happy you live during the dispensation of grace? I am. What, you know, what I do every so often is uh, sometimes, I don't, I don't so much leave the house without my keys because you can't drive real far without your keys. So I, I rarely leave the house without my keys. But sometimes I'll leave my house without something else. You know, at times I've left it without my computer, and so you get to work, and you're like, I don't have my computer, so I can't do anything. Sometimes I've left home without my badge, so now I can't get into the building. And what I find is, is just myself, and I think this is human nature, do you have the capacity to mess up almost anything? I mean, I admit that I have that. I see it myself all the time. The beauty of the dispensation of grace according to Ephesians 1, what happens when you believe the gospel? When you believe the gospel, you're sealed, you're given the Holy Spirit as an earnest of your inheritance. Once you believe, salvation is unmess upable. That's not a word. But you can't, you can't ruin it. You can't forfeit it during the dispensation of grace, right? Once you believe, you're sealed, you don't have to worry about it. There's no reason to stress about it. Is that how it works during the 70th week? where it talks about people falling away. I, I, I absolutely love the fact that I believe the gospel, it's resolved, and that's it. Now, that doesn't mean live any old way you want, but it means we ought to be confident and joyful, and we had not to worry about stuff like that. There's a decent amount of, of churchianity that wants you to worry about your salvation, right? that you can lose it and you can fall away and so on, and, and you just can't today. Matthew 24, verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Well, if there's many false prophets and they deceive many, obviously there is a lot of deception. 
Now, here's my comment on that. People hear that, and, and here's what they think. I get it. There's a lot of people that are deceived, but they're not as smart as I am. It isn't that human nature? When they take surveys of people, the majority of people believe they are an above average driver. In other words, they're a more safe, responsible, prudent driver. Now, mathematically, it is not possible for the majority of people to be above average drivers, right? But the majority of people think they are. The majority of people, the vast majority, think that they're smart and clever and that they're right. Have you ever been in an argument and someone says, well, you just think you're right? Everyone thinks they're right, or else they wouldn't think it. But of course, what is the truth? The vast majority of the earth is wrong about every important detail. Isn't that true? I mean, it, you know, I'm just sorry to offend anyone, but if, if, if you're not a King James, mid-acts, saved by grace, eternal security, pre-trib dispensationalist, then you're wrong about the most basic issues of life. Right? And the vast majority of the earth is wrong about that. Well, what, what Scripture tells you, Matthew 24, and it's telling people in advance. Remember when we were in, in verse 4 and it says, I, Behold, I tell you before? It's telling them in advance, you're going to be deceived about this. There's going to be deception, so you better take heed. You better be really, really careful because your soul is at stake. And there's many false prophets, and they shall deceive many. And anyone that, that, that's not a fool should realize, wait a minute, I could be one of those that, that will be deceived. I better take very, very careful heed. I better pay very close attention. God is kind. He tells people that beforehand. But what's going to happen with the earth? The vast majority of the world is going to wonder after the beast, which means they're going to fall into the deception. That's what's coming. Verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Get Revelation 3, verse 15. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. This is written to the church at Laodicea. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. So what Matthew 24 is talking about, when it says, because iniquity shall be abound. So that tells you what the 70th week is like. It's a time of great iniquity. What's going to happen? The love of many shall wax cold. So the love of many shall wax cold. Revelation 3 talks about many will be lukewarm. What happens to people's spiritual lives during that time? It's cold. It's dead. It's lifeless. And obviously being cold is a problem, but even being lukewarm is a problem, isn't it? According to Revelation chapter 3, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Go back to Matthew 24, verse 13. Now, there's different thoughts on this. I'm just going to tell you what I understand. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. I think the most natural reading of that verse is that you have to endure. You have to endure unto the end to be saved. That's what it's saying. Look with me at Ezekiel 18, verse 24. Ezekiel 18, verse 24. Now, Ezekiel 18 is obviously an, it's an explanation of how justification works during the Old Testament. But I think it, it also is helpful in understanding Matthew 24, 13. So Ezekiel 18, verse 24. But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. The idea of verse 24 is there's a righteous man, but what happens? He doesn't continue in his righteousness. And so 
what happens in the trespass that he does, he, he, he dies. That's not talking about physical death, because no matter how righteous you are under the Old Testament, you can't avoid physical death. It's talking about spiritual death. Verse 25, Yet ye say, The way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and dieth in them, for his iniquity that he hath done shall he die. That's a spiritual death there. Verse 27. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Now here's what I understand to be the case. Uh, under, under the Old Testament economy, the way that it worked, you had to continue in righteousness. That's what Ezekiel 18 is saying. When the righteous man turns from it, what happens? In the soul that is sinneth, he shall die. What happens when the wicked man begins to do righteousness? He's accepted under that verse. So under the Old Testament, do you need to continue in well-doing? It seems that you do. Matthew 24, 13 specifically says, But he that shall endure in the end, the same shall be saved. Obviously the implication is, if you don't endure unto the end, you're not saved. Now consider this. Look at verse 14, Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So what gospel is preached during the 70th week? The gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom clearly requires endurance unto the end. So we've, we've heard earlier in verse 11 about false prophets. Do you think the false prophets are preaching the gospel of the kingdom? I mean, obviously not, because if they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom, they're not false prophets. What I ponder, do the false prophets preach the gospel of the grace of God? Would they have a textual basis for doing so? I mean, this is the, man, man is so perverse, right? So during the dispensation of grace, there's all sorts of people that teach all sorts of crazy things and they ignore Paul's apostleship. I ponder if what happens during the 70th week is there's a number of false prophets that affirm Paul's apostleship. If Matthew 24, 13 says you have to endure unto the end and your intent was to damn people, what a better thing to do than to teach eternal security? Hey, don't worry about it. You're sealed. You can't lose it. And there's a lot of verses in the scripture, they're Pauline, primarily, that teach you can't lose your salvation. So I ponder if what happens is, of course, during the dispensation of grace, the adversary opposes Pauline doctrine. Does he, during the 70th week, embrace Pauline doctrine because it's no longer appropriate? When you think about 1 Timothy 4, and it talks about doctrines of devils, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, there are verses in the scripture that tell you to do those things. But not during the dispensation of grace. If you take a correct scriptural verse, but you apply it in the wrong context, that is a doctrine of devils. That's what 1 Timothy 4 is saying. Are there lots of verses about commanding to abstain from meats? Well, Leviticus is all about commanding to abstain from meats. Leviticus 21, right? Or Leviticus 11, I'm sorry, Leviticus 11. But if you take Leviticus and you apply that during the dispensation of grace, when 1 Timothy 4, 4, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused, that's an evil doctrine, isn't it? You're misusing Leviticus. I just ponder if, if during the 70th week that Pauline teaching will be misused to preach a false gospel to people during that time. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Now notice this. And then shall the end come. So the first thing that, that or not the first thing, but one of the things that happens during the 70th week is the gospel of the kingdom has to be preached to all nations. 
Once it's preached to all nations, according to that verse, what happens next? The end shall come. And I think the end is described in verse 15. So look at verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Now that could hardly be more clear, <laughs> right? It tells you which prophet he's talking about, and it tells you the specific thing, the abomination of desolation. That, that's Daniel 9, obviously. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Now notice verse 16. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Get with me Luke 21. Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21 and verse 20. Luke 21 verse 20. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed, that's encircled, with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now what's fascinating, Luke 21.21 21 lines up perfectly with Matthew 24.16. They both say, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. The difference between the two is Matthew 24 says, when the abomination of desolation is set up, flee into the mountains. Luke 21 doesn't mention the abomination of desolation. It says, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, flee into the mountains. So what does that tell you? Those two events happen at the same time. During the 70th week, when the abomination of desolation is set up, at that same time, what's going to happen? Jerusalem is compassed with armies. Now, I'll just pause there. That's, that's wickedly clever, isn't it? If you compass Jerusalem with, if, if Satan compasses Jerusalem, or the beast, compasses Jerusalem with armies two years in to the 70th week, would your nerves get on edge? If the beast is so great... And what, what, what the man of sin does is he signs a covenant with Israel to guarantee them peace. Now let me just step back here for a minute and put this in context. It seems to me that one of the things that helps the man of sin be effective is Israel gets tired of the persecution, the suicide bombers, the mindless destruction. Right now, what Israel faces now and will face in the future is, you know, people just go in to supermarkets and blow up the supermarkets, right? And they go into, they, they kill school children and they just wreak all kinds of havoc. Well, as, as a member of that society, would you just get tired of that? There's all this loss of life for no reason, this destruction. And so when the man of sin comes to power, and he has the ability to say, let me guarantee you peace. I just need you to sign an agreement with me. So that can be very attractive. Sure. It's going to be very attractive. And the man of sin is going to be very charismatic. And so they're going to sign it joyfully. Now, by the way, you can decide what you think about this. Israel is basically the Silicon Valley of that part of the world. They have the best technology. They, they, ha they have the, the, the best, they, they have a powerful economic climate for how small they are. When they're guaranteed peace and there isn't all that destruction, things are really going to go well. Which I would suggest to you is part of the man of sins, the beast design, because what you want is if your ultimate goal is to destroy Israel then what you want is right now they're scattered among the nations. What you'd like to do is you'd like to get them all in one place so you could then destroy them that way. And what better way to get them there than to make them want to be there? Create an environment where there's guaranteed peace and also 
economic prosperity, why wouldn't you want to return to the motherland? And there's this guy that he looks an awful lot like the promised Messiah. The vast majority of Israel didn't accept the true one the first time he came. But this next one's going to look a lot like him. So if, if you're the man of sin and you're doing this, you don't want to deploy the armies too early. Because if you deploy the armies too early, then everyone has to say, well, okay, so if you're guaranteeing peace, like, why is this starting to look like a military state? So what happens, seems to me, based upon Matthew 24, 15, Luke 21, 20, is the compassing of Judea, of Jerusalem, with armies, doesn't happen until the very point at which the abomination of desolation is set up. When you, when you want to spring a trap, if, what would happen if you had a bear trap that took 20 seconds to activate and the jaws go... I mean, it's a totally ineffective trap. You want to do what? Sudden, quick, no foreshadowing, ruthless. That's what happens in the middle of the 70th week. You follow me? The abomination of de desolation is set up, and it's that moment in time that Jerusalem is compassed with armies. And, and by the way, wouldn't that make it difficult to flee? Because that's when they're told to flee. The armies are there to prevent them from fleeing. Just notice the, it, it's, it's wickedly clever, but that, that's, that's what's going on. All right, Matthew 24, 16. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. They're not told to flee into the mountains prior to that. They're told to flee at that time. Get Luke 21, verse 21, and get Mark 13, verse 14. So we'll first look at Luke 21, verse 21. We just read this, but let's read it again. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Notice they're specifically told where to flee. They're to flee to the mountains. Mark 13, verse 14. Mark 13, verse 14. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand, then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. So just notice this. In three different passages, when, when the folks are told to flee, they're specifically told to flee to the mountains. They're not just told to flee Jerusalem. They're not told to just, you know, go anywhere. But it is specifically to the mountains that they are told to flee. We're going to talk about that more in a minute. Go to Matthew 24, verse 17. Matthew 24, verse 17. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. So if you're up on the roof... Don't get in the house and get your stuff. Just jump off the roof and leave. Verse 18, Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Get Luke 17, verse 31. Luke 17, verse 31. In that day... He which shall be upon the housetop, and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Notice verse 32. Remember Lot's wife. What was Lot's wife's problem? She didn't really want to leave, right? Look with me at Genesis 19. Let's, let's look at this for a minute. Genesis 19. Now while you're getting there, let, let me just sort of make this point. It's a difficult thing to leave your house and all your stuff. Right? Because it's, it's what you're used to. It's where you've been. You've got a lot of things there that are creature comforts. It, it's, it's, it's a scary thing to just leave everything you have. Genesis 19, verse 15, And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, 
lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. Verse 16, and while he lingered. Now, Lot is described as righteous elsewhere, isn't he? But, but what, what's happening here? He lingers because he's just reluctant to leave his home, right? They're telling him, we're going to destroy the city. It would be good for you to get out of here. But notice, he lingers. Look with me at verse 17. And it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee. Neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain. That's interesting. Because it said, remember Lot's wife. Lest thou be consumed. So when it says, look not behind, a couple things on that. If you're running in a race, and you're in first place, you're tempted to look behind and see how far back second place is, right? But what happens when you do that? It slows you down. It, it, you need to resist that urge, because if you're running and, and things are decided in small margins, you just need to run on. Well, look not behind. Lot will be tempted to look back at his home, and he will emotionally not want to leave. Notice verse 26. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. I think that... Is, is metaphorically, or you know, it's indicative of things during the 70th week. In other words, if the abomination of desolation is set up and Jerusalem is compassed with armies, and it says, if you're on the housetop, don't go in the house, just jump and run, you have to sprint, right? You, you, you have to get out of there as fast as you can. You can't linger and you can't look back. And of course, the reason why people want to look back is because they don't emotionally want to leave. It's going to be an act of faith, isn't it, to jump off the house, take nothing with you, not even your coat, right, remember? Remember about the one that was working in the field? And just run. It's going to be an act of faith to trust God to provide. Many folks, I hope I'm wrong on this, many folks aren't going to be willing to do that. They're going to, they're going to linger. They're going to be hesitant. Just consider this. One of the realities of people taking the mark is it says you're not going to be able to buy or sell. Well, there are going to be people that are very comfortable with their life. I'm comfortable with my situation. I have this money in the bank, and I can buy food at the store, and I like what I have. And if I don't take the mark, what am I going to do? All, all the wealth I have is going to disappear because I can't spend it, right? No one will take it. And a lot of people are going to take the mark it's going to be like Esau, right? What did Esau do? Esau's like, my belly needs food. So he sells his birthright. Philippians 3 says whose God is their belly. So what's going to happen during the 70th week is people are going to, because of their, their, their belly, their comfort with their, their circumstances, they're going to take the mark because they're not going to have the willingness to say, I'm going to run into the mountains with nothing. It's a brutal temptation, isn't it? We'll talk about this in a minute, but one time about woe unto them that give suck. I could be wrong on this, but I suspect, suspect this is what it is. What happens if you have little ones and you can't buy or sell. And your neighbors and family will say, shame on you, you're a bad provider. You have a little child, and you're not doing the simple things that you ought to do to take care of them. Shame on you. Now, of course, the truth of the matter is, they're telling you to do something that will damn your soul eternally. And you should reject it. But do you see the pressures that are going to come upon people? It's It's brutal. It's going to be cruel. It's going to be coercive. Matthew 24, 19. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. Verse 20. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, 
neither on the Sabbath day. Now I'm going to spend some time on this verse because this is one of those that just I, I find puzzling or difficult or so on. So it says, pray ye that, but pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. And I'll just be honest with you, my gut reaction is Sabbath day. <laughs> if I'm, I'm running away from the beast, I don't care if it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'm just going to run, 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 run. I mean, what, why, why, would I, <laughs> why would I care about that? But yet, obviously, there's a reason to. So let's, let's make sure we understand this. Get Matthew 19. No word of Scripture is wasted. Everything in Scripture makes sense. When it doesn't seem to make sense, our understanding is, is, is shorthanded, right? If there's something that doesn't make sense to us, the problem is with our understanding. Matthew 19, 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good Master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life... Keep the commandments. So in Matthew 19, the Lord specifically instructs the keeping of the Old Testament law. Now the gospel of the kingdom was preached during that time, but was keeping of the Old Testament law required? I think so. That's the way I understand it, it was. Get with me Acts 21, verse 21. Now in Acts 21, 21, obviously, this is after Paul's been saved. This is after the revelation of the mystery. And what we see during the book of Acts is, of course, we see overlap between the dispensation of grace and the kingdom program. One of the things, here's, here's why the book of Acts, why people struggle with it, in my opinion. What they want to do is they want to draw a vertical line. Like if you think of 2021 and 2022, the last day of, of 2021 is December 31, 2021. The first day of 2022 is January 1, 2022, right? And you can draw this nice vertical line, and everything to this side is 2021, and everything to this side is 2022, and isn't that convenient? Is that the way the book of Acts worked? Is there a line you can draw, and everything before this is all kingdom church, and nothing after this is kingdom church, and everything after this is body of Christ, or are there two programs simultaneously in effect? Doesn't Galatians 2 tell you that what happens is Peter and the Twelve give the right hand of fellowship to Paul, and they say, you do your ministry, we're going to do ours, and they do it at the same time. And so one of the, the, the things that is sort of foolish, and it's amazing how often this happens, people spend a bunch of time trying to understand minute details of the book of Acts, and their confused understanding of the book of Acts causes them to deny clear statements in Paul's epistles. Right? So they, 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 they go to a book that is clearly a transition book where there's two programs in effect. They reach some conclusion there, and they end up rejecting clear Pauline revelation. You see that happen all the time. It's, it's, it's a sad thing, but it's just you know, one of the realities. So look at Acts 21.21. 21. Now this is when Paul is in Jerusalem, and he's speaking with the elders of the kingdom church. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after their customs. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say to thee, we have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing but that thou thyself also walkest orderly, notice this, and keepest the law. Clearly the kingdom church, they were keeping the law. They were under the vows. If you think about Hebrews 8, verse 13. Hebrews 8, verse 13. In the, I'll just read it to you. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Let's ponder that for a minute. So, my contention would be, Romans is obviously addressed to the great Gentile power of that time. So as you're reading through the scriptures, and you come to the book of Acts, you're like, what's going on here? And then you come to a book of, called Romans. What a strange book! Aren't the Jews God's chosen people? Why is there a book addressed to Gentiles, right? And then what Romans, of course, is, is Romans is the first of Paul's books in canonical order that explains 
the dispensation of grace, and it's addressed to, to, to Romans. What's fascinating is the first book after Paul's series of books is called Hebrews, and it explains the cross to those under the kingdom program. Now, what's interesting in Hebrews 8.13, when it talks about the Old Covenant, it says that it's ready to vanish away. Well, if it's ready to vanish away, guess what it hasn't done? It hasn't vanished away yet. Because it's not going to vanish away until the new covenant is put in place. So my contention is this. I think the way that it works is the old covenant, the Old Testament is put in place, and for Israel, it's not done away with until the new one is put in place at the second coming. And thus, Israel remains under the Old Testament law. That's why you see what you see in Acts 21. That's why you see what you see in Matthew 19 when the Lord says, keep the commandments. Look at me at Revelation 12, verse 17. Revelation 12, verse 17. Now, Revelation 12, 17 is obviously doctrine that applies during the 70th week. And notice what it says, Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Notice what it says here. Which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So what does the believing remnant do during the 70th week? It seems to me there's two things they do. One of them is they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. They believe on the correct Christ, not the false one. And what else do they do? They keep the commandments of God. Revelation 14.12 says something very similar. We won't turn there for the sake of time. Get with me Luke chapter 6. I want to now show you something about the Sabbath day. So what I would suggest to you based upon the verses we just looked at is that under the kingdom program, during the 70th week, the law remains in effect. So when we're in Matthew 24, and it says, Pray ye that your flight be not on the Sabbath day, the reason it says that is they're under the law. They are required to observe the rules regarding the Sabbath day. Now, are you required to observe those today during the dispensation of grace? Obviously not. There's multiple verses on that. You know them. Look with me at Luke chapter 6. And let's just go to verse 9. We won't read the whole passage. But notice what the Lord says here. Then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or destroy it? And what the Lord does in regard to the Sabbath day is there's times where he and the disciples are criticized for what they're doing on the Sabbath day. And what he does is he points out to those critics that they have a misunderstanding of the Sabbath day because it is actually lawful to do good on the Sabbath. You're not allowed to work in a way uh, for your sort of own sort of benefit, but it's lawful to do good is what he is saying in verse 9. Now here's the thing that made me sort of struggle with this. If it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath, well, isn't it a good thing to flee from the beast, right? In other words, why should you... If you're, if you're on the earth during the 70th week, you see the abomination of desolation set up, you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, well, you're clearly told to flee. So obviously you should do that. But then it says, pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath day. Get with me Acts chapter 1, verse 12. I'll give you what's the, the best of my understanding of this. And... Maybe there's other things that someone could share with me. I don't know. But it seems to me that the Sabbath day is a limitation on how far the little flock can flee if the abomination of desolation is set up on the Sabbath. That seems to me what it's saying. So look with me at Acts 1, verse 12. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Now, isn't that interesting? 
So all of that is specifically described in that verse as what? A mount. Where were they told to flee? Three times. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. To the, to the mountains. Here we're told Mount Olivet is how far away from Jerusalem? A Sabbath day's journey. So apparently it would be lawful even on the Sabbath day to flee to Mount Olivet, wouldn't it? That's what it's saying. Matthew 24, 16 said, flee into the mountains. Now, just in case you're interested, how long is a Sabbath day's journey? If, if you compare John 11 and Mark 11, uh, it'll tell you that it's 15 furlongs. So how long is a furlong? A furlong is an eighth of a mile. So 15 furlongs is one mile and seven eighths. So a Sabbath day's journey is right under two miles. So what seems to be the case is if the abomination of desolation is set up on a Sabbath, then you can only flee so far, you can only flee a Sabbath day's journey, but where would you be able to get to that would be consistent with fleeing into the mountains? You would flee to Mount Olivet. Now, by the way, in Matthew 24, when the Lord is giving this discourse, where is he giving it from? He's on Mount Olivet, if you look at verse 3. Isn't that fascinating? So he's sitting there telling them this, telling them, you know, pray that it's not on the Sabbath day, but if it's on the Sabbath day, you know where you're likely to end up? Right here where we are. So that's what I think is going on there. Um, maybe there's, there might be details I'm missing, so if I am, just tell me, and I'll be grateful for that. Matthew 24, verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation. Now this is just an interesting definitional thing, but I don't think the 70th week as a whole is great tribulation. Because that verse just told us what? For then shall be great tribulation. If you think about Revelation 12, when the devil is cast down to earth, and it says he has great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time, I think what it's really showing you is, although none of the 70th week is something you want to live through, the great tribulation is the second half of it. For then, after the abomination of desolation is set up, for then shall be great tribulation. Look with me at verse 22. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake the, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there believe it not, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now what's fascinating about that in, in verse 24 is the deception is so great, if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. Meaning it's not possible to deceive the very elect. One of the things that reminds me of is 1 John 3, verse 9. 1 John 3, verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So what seems to me happens is Matthew 24, 13, you have to endure unto the end during the 70th week. The end is the abomination of desolation being set up. And then there's this great deception. But what happens? You know what the Holy Spirit does? The Holy Spirit operates in such a way that whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. And the reason why is it says he cannot sin. God acts in a way to preserve the believing remnant. All right, let's skip down for the sake of time to verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. What, what that always reminds me of, and it's just a worldly illustration, but if you think about the first Gulf War that the United States was involved in, 
what, what happened in that war is before, well, the, the first thing that the, that the U.S. did is destroyed all of the Iraqi electronic radar. So they had no ability to track planes. And then I don't know if you remember some of the footage, but what would happen is the Iraqis had anti-aircraft batteries that were just firing blindly in the dark because they couldn't get any radar lock, but they knew the planes were there, and so they're just firing blindly into the dark hoping to hit something. Well, essentially what the United States did was first destroyed all the electronic capabilities, electronic radar capabilities, and then when you attack at night, they can't see with their own eyes, they're completely and utterly defenseless because they're being attacked in the dark by something they can't see. And obviously the Gulf War was effective in its, its aims. Matthew 24, what the Lord Jesus Christ seems to do at the second coming is what does he do? He turns off the light in the universe. For the sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon into blood before the coming of the great notable day of the Lord. Look with me then at verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. So he, he makes everything dark. The sun doesn't give any light. The moon doesn't give any light. And then you see the sign of the Son of Man coming, and everyone on earth has to say, man, this is bad. Right? He just turned off all the natural phenomenon, and the only thing we can see is him. And it says, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They know what's coming. All right. Skip down to Matthew 24, verse 37. I'm just going to make a couple more points here. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The idea, of course, of Noah is that as the flood is coming, people are marrying and giving in marriage. They're completely oblivious to the fact that destruction is about to happen and everything's going to be destroyed. Look with me at Daniel 2, verse 41. Daniel 2, verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Now notice verse 43. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, men are made out of clay because they're made out of the dust of the earth. Iron is indicative of angels, I would suggest to you. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Well, you know what happened in Genesis 6. The sons of God came down and took wives of the daughters of men. We're told that the coming of the Son of Man is as the days of Noe. In Revelation 12, when there's war in heaven, what happens to the devil and his angels? They're cast out where they cast down. They're cast down to the earth, and... Don't things on the earth then look a lot like Genesis 6, where the sons of God came down and married human women? Now, that's what happens uh, right before the second coming. It's just like the days of Noe. Matthew 24, verse 33. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Now, you know from other passages, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 Peter 3, that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So ponder this with me if you would. The reason why thieves come in the night is, is they're harder to see. So when someone's breaking into your next door neighbor at night, you can't tell who did it. That's, it it's, part of, it's part of being surreptitious. It's part of being deceitful. It's part of being surprising. If the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night, and right before that happens, the sun is turned into darkness, the moon into blood, isn't that a perfectly literal fulfillment? He comes as a thief in the night, and the first thing he does before that is he turns off the sun and the moon. Just sort of fascinating. Verse 44, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. 
So obviously it's a warning to be ready. Now my topic was the 70th week and Israel's resurrection into the millennium. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the resurrection into the millennium. Sorry because I spent so much time on this other part. But I'll, I'll, I'll just say this. Um, look with me at, uh, turn with me to Revelation 20 just quickly. Revelation 20, verse 6. Let's actually start in, in verse... Uh, I'm just going to go to Ezekiel 37, 11 for the sake of time. That's what I'll do. Ezekiel 37, verse 11. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. And shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. I'll make this point on this, and then I'll, and then I'll conclude. When you think of the millennial kingdom, what happens at the second coming is Jesus Christ returns. It's a day of wrath. He destroys his enemies. Matthew 13, 41 says, He gathers out of his kingdom all things that offend. Satan is put in the bottomless pit to deceive the nation, to, so that he can deceive the nations no more. In other words, it is a perfectly righteous kingdom. The devil's tied up. At the beginning of, of the millennium, he killed everyone that, that thought he shouldn't be king. Jesus Christ reigns as a just ruler, a benevolent, gracious dictator. Not in any bad sense, it's a perfect, perfect rulership. What happens at the end of the millennium? Satan is loosed for a little season, and the number who participate in the rebellion is what? As the sand of the sea. What that tells you is that tells you something about the heart of man. What Satan does when he's released from the bottomless pit and he goes out and he deceives the nations, he deceives the nations because it was already in the heart of man to resent the Lord's rule. In other words, during the millennium, think about this with me. At the beginning of the millennium, you're told in Revelation that blood flows at a horse's bridle for 200 miles for 1,600 furlongs. Someone, when Satan is released, should raise their hand and say, wait a minute, I know you're planning to go up to Jerusalem and kill him because you don't like him, but the last time someone tried this, blood flowed for 200 miles. You should really reconsider. But they don't. And you know why they don't? Because the heart of man is such that even when there is a perfect king and he rules righteously and justly, they resent him. And when given the chance, they'll be deceived and they'll go up to kill him. And that's what happens at the end, at, at, you know, when Satan is loosed at the end of the millennium. What all that adds up to is this. What God demonstrates throughout time is man's failure under any possible arrangement. You put him in the garden, has no sin nature, all you have to do is keep one commandment, he fails. You give him detailed laws, he fails. You give him a conscience, he fails. You give him the dispensation of grace. How could you mess that up? You don't even have to do anything other than just trust what's been done for you. And you get to the end of it and the church is totally apostate. What's tragic about Romans 11 the dispensation of grace continues until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And the reason the fullness of the Gentiles become in is that the vast majority of the Gentiles on earth say, we don't need any of that salvation stuff. We're good. So God says, okay. If that's what you want, then we'll go with my plan, the prophetic calendar, the 70th week. So these are, these are sobering things. Praise the Lord for our salvation today as a free gift during the dispensation of grace. Father God, thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth contained in it. Help us, Lord, 
to be busy to give people the gospel that they might be saved. We give you all the glory. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you. If you don't mind, uh, we're going to keep that request to do a song right quick. We're going to send a song right quick before we stop. And then we'll take a break. Right. In New York Harbor stands a lady with a torch raised to the sky, and all who see her know. the brave and the free and I will honor our flag and our trust in God and the statue of liberty on lonely God stood across with my Lord raised to the sky and all who kneel there live forever as the Call a Christian to be named with a ransom and whole, and as the statue liberates the citizens, so the cross liberates. Is my statue of liberty, for it was there that my soul was made free, and unashamed I'll proclaim that old rugged cross as my statue. of living.